So as we are all here, we are in this session called how overcoming barrier youth participation in delivering uh, adaptation. So the objective of the station is to understand, uh, first of all, is to share good uh, practice, experience, and lesson learned from the youth uh, across the globe who are present. And also the event will focus on promoting cooperative action to overcome the barriers of youth engagement on adaptation, whether in project design, uh, policy making, or even awareness on the community level. And also we will, we will identify the action and opportunities to strengthen uh, enabling environments and enhance the provision of supporting adaptation in the context of specific policies, practices, and local uh, at action at the local level. So basically what we'll be doing, we, we, we will uh, create a safe room for everyone to understand uh, how the youth can, what the youth are doing right now and what the youth are willing to, uh, to contribute towards to, to change uh, the system as they're working right now and to empower our work in community-based adaptation projects. I would like to, inter uh, to go forward for this month to provide us the next agenda. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Grace. Um, so, uh, bas uh, basically, at this point, we want to take a very short time to know who is in the room. We would like to, uh, by way of geographical location, where the person is coming from, um, age range, uh, and uh, profession, um, just to, to understand, to have a basic understanding of who is in the room and uh, where are they uh, coming from or representing. Uh, with this, I uh, think Alex would help me to rule out the poll. Yeah, so I hope you can all see this on your screen. Uh, so you just go ahead and then let's follow it as we go on. Okay. Looks like I have everyone responding to this and uh, very amazing results. Okay. Okay. Great, um, thank you so much. Um, let's move on quickly. And I would have, I would now have um, two amazing gentlemen uh, who are quite experienced mid-career level in uh, as far as youth matters are concerned. So I would have uh, first Joshua Amponsen, uh, director for Green Africa Youth Organization. Uh, to speak on the underlying challenges and barriers for youth engagement. And following that would also be Ifan Ula. So Joshua, let's start with you. Hello everyone. I'm very happy that uh, we have uh, 33 people in this session. Um, so thanks to everyone who, who made it. Um, we, the session will look at uh, barriers that young people face when they seek to engage uh, in climate adaptation and looking at the poll results, I'm very, very excited that we have a sort of majority being in civil society and private sector. Um, and also then on the other side, uh, having students uh, also here. Uh, we're going to look at, I think, issues that particularly uh, folks on the call who are coming from civil society policy making and the private sector would 
uh, would agree to. Uh, at the same time, students and young people also agree to that these are challenges they face. So a bit of a background to what I'll be sharing as barriers. Uh, in 2019, um, I co-led a research for the Global Commission on Adaptation. Um, and the research was to identify um, what, what, are, what role young people can play in adaptation. Um, and also, secondly, to identify where the gaps are and how uh, stakeholders could fill that gap. Um, so as part of the research, we held uh, consultations with uh, within 10 countries uh, with young people uh, and youth organizations um, and sort of had an online survey as well, talking to different youth groups, uh, of which some are also present on the call. Uh, so very happy to see people who have been part of this work on the call as well. Um, so gathering all these data and all this information and developed uh, what we call Adapt for Our Future. Uh, which was a report to say that institutions and current stakeholders need to increase adaptation efforts to protect our future as young people. Uh, part of that was also to really put young people uh, in the center of adaptation uh, and to put young people in the center of adaptation will mean that we need to identify what prevents them or what prevents uh, uh, children and youth from taking part actively in adaptation. Um, and some of the barriers that we came across through this research, uh, and I'm going to share my screen quickly and take you through this uh, very simple uh, uh, one page, one page that I have here. Um, so one of the challenges uh, that when we think about youth and climate adaptation, uh, and particularly in the context of locally led action, uh, is education, uh, education challenges to assess education or training on programs and activities that are done at the governance level uh, within local communities. Um, also access to education in the, in the context of understanding the conceptual framing of adaptation and even more particularly community-based adaptation. Um, so this already pre presents a barrier for young people uh, when they think of uh, getting engaged on adaptation. For on the side of, of, uh, of policymakers, I mean, it's been very, uh, it's been very common that engaging with stakeholders, you hear a common phrase that, oh, they don't understand the details of it when we engage with young people, they don't understand the complexity. Um, these phrases are coming from the side that young people do not have access to all the training that is needed to be able to support institutions more firmly. And hence, most of the advocacy or, or the, the quest and the push to engage uh, uh, on community-based adaptation or adaptation uh, in a more general sense uh, then has its own limitations, which doesn't make it very, very attractive uh, for, for, for some stakeholders to engage. The second uh, part, which, uh, which is a very significant barrier, even when young people have uh, access to education and access to training, and could actively very support very much. The challenge is that institutions are not set up in a way that they have a, spe a specific mandate or focus to uh, uh, open up the space to receive uh, 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 young people and their aspiration ideas uh, and proposals. So in, in a very local context at the local governance level, uh, you realize that most young people who are engaged in these projects are working with uh, civil society groups, or, or even most often INGOs, uh, and not their own city city uh, mayors or municipalities or districts uh, at this level. And this is because at that level, most uh, across the world, uh, most uh, communities do not have the structure that you have a, a structure and an office that focuses on getting young uh, the input of young people in or integrating young people into the work itself. Uh, in best case scenarios, you will have a youth council or some once in a while youth engagement, uh, which could be in the form of a town hall meeting or could be in the form of uh, having a survey or, or, or a dialogue with young people. And this happens once in a while and every conversation is integrated in this town hall meeting, which doesn't really allow for, for what uh, uh, the youth and, and children aspire when it comes to uh, adaptation it doesn't make it really, really ideal. Um, but I would like to talk about is lack of credibility. And I think a lot of people really agree to this, uh, that um, 
uh, young people struggle to have credibility because they're one of all, first of all, they are not seen as experts. Uh, secondly, because of the traditional uh, settings of most uh, uh, communities and cultures does not really put emphasis on, on the work of young people uh, and rather looking at uh, whatever degree they are holding or whatever expertise they might have in terms of proving expertise or years of experience or all these traditional uh, systems and stru structures we have in place, which really then makes it difficult why uh, uh, um, um, an organization or, or a city uh, governance structure should invite a group of young people to sit and talk about the next uh, 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 ecosystem-based strategy or the next uh, uh, strategy towards floods or droughts within a community. And this makes it difficult. I think the last part is finance, which is obviously for the whole adaptation space and for community-based adaptation uh, as, a, as a whole. Finance is still a struggle. How do we get finance to reach local communities? And this is a, a session that will be done uh, I believe uh, on, on, on tomorrow or Thursday, there'll, there'll be a, uh, uh, or Friday, there'll be a session on innovative financing for locally led action. Uh, um, and this is very important because I think that for young people engaged in, in adaptation discourse at the, at the local level, or even in the implementation phase as well, um, usually money is a, is a big challenge. How to profile the, the, the work they do or the organization itself to reach a standard where they, they can receive money from the central government since most adaptation funds sit at a central uh, governance level uh, or have to be sourced from international organizations and sort of this uh, 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 lack of uh, uh, flexibility on funding makes it really, really difficult. Having said these barriers, I think it's very, very important to just take a few seconds to highlight some, some key things which came out of this research as well. Um, realizing that when it comes to community-led adaptation, young people play a, clinic, a critical role in terms of the implementation. So when it comes to implementation, from, from most of the interviews we had with stakeholders uh, who are implementing on the ground, like UNDP, SNV, GIZ, uh, and, and colleagues who are, who are working in this, in this field, in the field of practice, typically young people are the ones involved in the implementation process. Decision-making is done with community leads, which is done with at the governance level, but when it comes to actual implementation, young people are the ones uh, involved in this heavily. The second part is that young people are also using different means of, uh, different means to, to sort of adapt at the community level and entrepreneurship is one of the most significant uh, areas where young people are helping their communities to adapt by creating enterprise and social businesses uh, using this approach, which is really, really worth looking at, especially in rural context. Uh, this is uh, very significant and has to be given the right attention. Um, and I think the last point I will make is that we are at a point where knowledge transfer is not just moving knowledge from uh, institutions with long health experience or even people with sort of uh, who are old gray hair uh, with a lot of experience, but also now knowledge transfer is also from young people to the older generation. And this is very important given the technological development that happened over the last uh, two decades. So this is something to note uh, that these barriers have to be overcome if you want to tap into the, the advantage of engaging with young people and their design the drive in entrepreneurship, in community led action, in knowledge transfer, and also in the, uh, their uh, um, rapidness to adopt new forms of, of governance and political expression, which we see today. I will pause it here and pass it over to, to Ethan. Um, Ethan, over to you, thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, George, for summarizing it uh, to, to very well and for mentioning the key point. I will just add some more point. Uh, for example, as, um, as a regional focal point of um, United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth somehow have involved from last two, three years with young people, and especially uh, the youth from uh, from Global South. And I'm also writing my thesis uh, and I have an interview with a lot of these relevant stakeholders like uh, uh, different UN entities, uh, different government uh, and different NGOs, I NGOs. So the point of which somehow coming in our conversation is um, about the youth and especially about the, the different movement which the youth have if you talk about Friday for Future or Extension Rebellion. So they, the, this actually the burning point from this relevant big player, we can see the stakeholder, they are telling us that, yeah, it's nice that somehow youth are uh, going on the street and demanding for climate justice and, and things like that. 
Uh, but when it's come to the real concrete solution, when you ask them, do you people having some solution to give it to us? Uh, so this is the point where somehow uh, the youth are not clear what actually they want to do and how they will do it, which also make their voices less effective in this whole um, movement. Uh, so it also goes to the capacity uh, and, and the knowledge of the young people that how much aware they are of this whole climate change adaptation or disaster risk reduction arena. So one of the uh, barrier which uh, uh, I think is uh, crucial that should be considered that we need to build the capacity of the young people, not just to come on, on the street to voice their rights. It is good that they are coming on the street and demanding for, uh, and, and having a demand uh, for the future. But it's also really important to have uh, some kind of solution that will also make the voices of the young people more effective. Uh, and it will having more kind of um, uh, appreciative uh, behavior from those big players. So that was actually, uh, the first point and second point is about tokenism. Like these days, we saw a lot of uh, these organizations, somehow they took you uh, as a token in their conferences or in their trainings and somehow they are putting them on the front table, giving them the opportunity to speak on the opening ceremony. But after that ceremony or after that uh, conference, nothing concrete can come up. So I think so it's, uh, it's also the, the main point where the organization should really take the voices of youth serious and not that use them as a, just a token, but also to to give them proper inclusion in their whole negotiation and planning processes. Uh, just talk about bureaucracy. So I think so it's also like this whole government structure, how it's work. So somehow we see in a lot of places, for example, especially when something in, in community level, uh, and for example, our voices, a few somehow if it travel from local level from bottom to top so it's like take a lot of time and somehow it disappear in this whole structure of bureaucracy so this also one of the main barrier where the um, this government should also take it serious and somehow make things flexible for for the young people not to make things complicated for them to somehow maybe to come up with a uh, with, with with some a platform on on also on the local national international level or maybe in each country, if they're having like this youth focal point at national level, where the youth can put their uh, the demand in front of them, uh, somehow this youth office can also work on the capacity building uh, of the young people. So I think so that will be also one of the, the solution for this whole processes. Uh, and the last thing which I will talk about is the financial um, barrier. So usually uh, it's, I think so the big issue youth having these is uh, despite that having some innovative idea, especially the youth who are involved in, in the community level. So uh, if they want to, to approach for funding, for support, somehow those donors are demanding them to have a kind of structure, you know, like they should have a good um, history before doing a mini project. But as a youth, as a beginner, uh, it's, it's not that much easy, you know, that you have your own team of five or six people and you have like experience a do project before for five or five years, for four or five years, you know. Uh, so usually the donor should also change their behavior, especially if they want to, to work with, uh, with the young people. So I think so, yeah, these are some of the main um, uh, barriers which young people have. Uh, and which, which should really need to work on it. Uh, and it, the government should, to be honest, really take it serious because these days, yeah, yeah, everyone is talking about youth, but yeah, somehow no one listened to youth. So I think so it's, it's time because the future belongs to us, not to those old people, we can say. So they should really take our way serious and they should let us uh, to plan for a future. And so, yeah, that will be, I think, so that's some of the solution for the issue. Yeah, thank you. Over to Dasmon. Yeah. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you so much, uh, Joshua and Ifan. Uh, these are rather very crucial points you have raised in terms of the barriers that, uh, that exist and for which reason we are not able to see the progress that we have to see in terms of youth involvement in adaptation and uh, community-based adaptation and fighting climate change in general. Um, uh, 
at this point, we would like to go into um, some three groups. Um, and the reason is that we would want to address two, three critical points for this discussion. It's for the purpose of streamlining the discussion from start to end. And for these three groups, we would have leads. Uh, for group one, we would have Elliot. Uh, for group two, we would have Ineza, Grace. And then for group three, we would have Zainab. Um, the polls are already rolled on, and I believe that most of you have picked the groups you want to, to be in. Am I right, Alex? I believe the uh, participants should be renaming themselves now. We'll post um, which groups they'll be on. Yes. Um, okay. Just, yeah, quickly. Um, so I'll, I'm going to rename myself um, with the three questions. I will uh, ask to invite the moderators to have like one minute each to just talk about their breakout room. So people on the call have an idea what the breakout room will be talking about to introduce their questions and also give room for participants to choose which room they want to go to. So if you can please allow the, the, the moderators to quickly introduce their sessions, that'd be great. Okay, thank you for the clarification, Josh. Uh, so we start with Elliot. Um, yeah, uh, tell the participants what you would be discussing Sure, so by way of introduction, my, way, my name is Elliot Connor. I'm living here in Sydney at the moment. I'm 17 years old, uh, so very much in the youth category. Uh, what I'd love to discuss with those of you in my breakout room uh, will be uh, the intergenerational dialogues. Uh, so I work uh, with a charity I founded called Human Nature Projects with volunteers working towards environmental courses across 105 countries uh, scaled over the past 12 months. So very much into the networking, uh, working across country barriers, uh, language barriers, but also the generational divide. Uh, so uh, some really interesting discussions I hope we can have and some learnings hopefully that you can take away as well. Thank you, Elliot. Grace? Uh, okay. Hi again, uh, so for me, uh, the group number two will be discussing on how can we enhance the participation of youth in the UNFCC ne negotiation by, by tackling the challenges of uh, empty promises and the lesson run on, learned on the ground. Because currently we are behind uh, the achievement of the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goal. So uh, we'll be discussing on how can we uh, better structure our voice for the change. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Zainab. Hello, everyone. Um, in breakout rule number three, with adaptation action, and how uh, youth can work to guide. the process and we'll be focusing on the on how to pick the ideas and take adaptation action in the context of the policy perspective and evidence-based information and then pitching the ideas to politicians and government agencies with different knowledge needs. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. So as we have heard the three, um, what we are supposed to do now, uh, also, this, these three questions have been typed in the chat. If you couldn't hear any of the speakers very well, you can check the chat. Uh, but what we are supposed to do now is to make our choices. Um, the first option is that you just go to participant, you see your name, you can name uh yourself one of the groups so for example um uh okay i would do mine now but you you just so my name is desmond alunua so i will just put for example group a i will put a and then continue with my name as it is already there and then you can do the same for 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 yourself if that is very difficult for you to do uh don't worry you can just type your name and add the group number 
in the chart and then the uh, the note takers will track it and also add you to the appropriate group. But for now, it will be easier if you just add A, for example, in Elliot, you see A, Elliot, you see B, Joshua. So let's try to do that now in one minute, please. Bodies and uh, decision making bodies. And I believe that while the scientists are well equipped to identify the first casualty, here comes a role of the social scientists, the political scientists to foster the collaboration and establish the second casual link. And to identify the target group behavior, team up to provide the advice that is not only within space but also the utilization focused uh, so that we can better um, implement the agenda which we are proposing as well as to make uh, the politicians ensure that whatever we are proposing is backed up by a proper evidence and it is going to make any difference. In this regard, I would like to identify that um, the, the gaps in the right reporting of the data is very important. Because all around the world, if we run a simple uh, Google search, we find that there is not uh, that kind of transparency which is required uh, to properly back up the adaptation actions all around the world, be it Global South, be it Global North. Uh, so we need to have a proper scientific evidence, which should not be dominated by any false positive. They were any false negative, and there is a need to ensure the transparency. Uh, while scientific findings are politically relevant, um, be it um, climate research, be any other field, uh, I, I believe that scientists need to understand how policy differs uh, from the research and awareness of the fact. Okay, guys, I hope you are able to hear me now clearly. Okay. I believe I should go back to one or two points, so maybe we can make it two way and anyone from the audience can share their views on the topic and maybe then I'll add a bit more. Oh, all right. So um, I basically was talking about the utilization uh, focused evaluation. Um, I believe that a pol a public administration is the main user of the scientific evidence for the policy making. Therefore, the scientific advice we provide to the policy makers go beyond providing a scientific evidence. Uh, because I believe that by using the jargons, we cannot make a layman understand what we are trying to communicate. We cannot try, uh, you know, be very successful in uh, conveying our plans and our uh, 
to the uh, policy uh, making bodies when we talk about it in perspective of the politician so it should uh, go beyond providing the specific evidence and we also need to recognize that evidence alone, alone is not enough for the policy makers to take appropriate measures but uh, it only passes the truth test but not the utility test and to become partially relevant uh, it should uh, be very practical and also we need to uh, foster the collaborations with the uh, scientific knowledge to address the first hand casualty but here we need to uh, develop uh, collaborations with the social scientist and the political scientist uh, that can help us establish the uh, target group behavior um, it's not only the evidence based but also the utilization focused then we need to identify the right data gaps and right reporting and show that whatever we report there is a there is an element of transparency uh, the scientific evidence should not be dominated by any false positive or any false negative because it may uh, cause ambiguity in the policy making later on and it may cause uh, somehow the negative impacts on the communities. So the fi uh, findings should be politically relevant. Policy makers also and emphasize the scientists understanding of how policy differs from the research findings and their awareness of the fact that when we inform the policy makers we need to transform our role from the perspective of the policy makers also the need to commit being transparent to fully disclose the research and information to the participant and to make our publish and the findings uh, completely transparent I hope that I've covered what I've missed earlier because of the internet connection problems. Okay, so let's make it a two-way process. I would like to love uh, to hear from anyone of the participants to uh, listen about their views on the gaps and how we can uh, bridge the gap between the evidence-based policy making and uh, the adaptation actions. Anyone? Okay, so I think that I should have some more points so since um, not most of our audience is okay. Yeah, please, Kovia, go on. Go on. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so uh, I just have one quick thought on how we can bridge the gap between uh, evidence-based policy making and adaptation. I want to focus majorly at the local level. When you're looking mm -hmm. at uh, uh, giving an example, for example, at the local level, the communities have the role to play in ensuring that adaptation is effective. So if you want to bridge that gap, we should make them part and parcel, for example, of the learning processes at the local level. Uh, are they able to assess adaptation? Are they able to document the practices in their own well informative ways? So that's in the future, if policy is being developed, if there's any issue in policy and we want information and evidence, it is the local people who are the target beneficiaries 
who present these evidences. And I think it carries more weight other than uh, bringing it right from the national levels or carrying evidence from the, local, from the national levels, yet we are not the target beneficiaries at the end of the day. So if the communities can be empowered to document their own practices, to give evidence of practices and adaptation, to foster learning at the local level, then we can be able to bridge the gap between adaptation practices and policy on adaptation. Thank you. That's my submission. Thank you, Skova. Uh, I think that's a very good point because obviously we need to incorporate the indigenous knowledge into the adaptation actions. And without that, I believe that we cannot uh, provide Um, thank you. Um, I think from my side is rather more a question than a, a good experience. I'm just thinking the relationships that are built in the moment when you start collecting the evidence. And I think like Skobja said, it's the community who has the understanding about the context and, and what's wrong in the context and how policies are maybe barriers for problems research because of the researcher who based on the evidence gathered from the local community and the relationships that are involved in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so you, you raise a very good question. Actually, the translating the scientific evidence into a concrete policy recommendation is actually very a very challenging task. Uh, whereas the scientific evidence of the uh, human-made climate change is robust and clear in the scientific community, and it has been proven uh, very earlier by the IPCC and other bot bodies. So I believe that um, it is a difficult process, but we need to slowly translate this knowledge into binding and effective policy interventions. Um, we, um, I recently got to know about an adaptation challenge by the UN uh, under the technical examination process and adaptation. So uh, I believe that such opportunities where we can pitch our ideas and then tweak them in accordance with the local communities or by taking the case studies. Uh, I believe that these are small opportunities where we can align our policy recommendations backed up by the scientific research. Let's take an example of research with XYZ person doing in a lab and then he or she finds a very uh, potential results, but these results um, sometimes go unreported and even if unreported, there is no practical implementation. So I believe that here becomes the role of that collaboration, which I was talking previously. We need to build that collaboration between the policymakers, between the academia and between the researchers to work in collaboration with each other and then to help at least adapt and, and you know, kind of uh, make some parts incorporated into the policy making process or even if not the policy making process at least at the negotiation level at the government tables and the decision making process and also um, there is a need to take the youth uh, to make them able to participate at the decision making table so this there there is a chance little chance uh, for the youth to communicate their findings and to uh, kind of share their views with the people who actually are responsible for implementing the right policies and for drafting the right policies. I hope that answers your question. Yes, hello, hello. Hi. 
Yes, uh, I also want to add to what you mentioned uh, in response to the question. I, mm -hmm. I also think that the um, fact that uh, adaptation is usually need-based, okay? Right. And policies, yes, need, it's need-based. So, and policies are also there to address the needs of the people. Policies are formulated to address the needs. They're either actions or inactions, basing on the needs and desires of the people. So I think that, it, that alone creates a very big opportunity. If the researcher at hand can be able to merge, you know, the interests of policymakers to the interest of the communities, then I think that becomes very, very, very substantial. Secondly, the researcher should be in position also bring evidence. You should be able to, to be in position to create out of your research that are friendly to the local people. And that is where the challenge has been. We create research and at the end of the day, yes, it will feed the policy makers, but the, the local implementers, the local people who are affected are not, I do not have the capacity, for example, to interpret or to, to get the information, to learn from the, the research that you've taken. Because at the end of the day, you collect information from them, but you don't give feedback to them in terms of your research findings in the simplest and most applicable uh, formats. And that, is a, that has been a very big gap. The policy makers up here think that the, the researcher has already bridged the gap between the policy and, and the people. But when it comes to translation, uh, simplifying the research, in order to bridge that gap, we need to go to that point that we feed as researchers, as youth, we have the opportunity to feed the local people with research that has been developed so that we can bridge that gap between the local people and the policy making. And that enables us to create strong evidence for adaptation and for policy making. Thank you. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Sovia. These are, I think, uh, great comments from your side. I completely agree. Okay, so we have some points in the chat, so oh, let's go towards them. If anyone has any comments, we'll take them after them. So uh, there is a question from Janet. Are there any good examples of successful collaborations? Um, Janet, um, are you talking about the collaborations between the academia and the government? Uh, then I'll provide you a context. I'm from Pakistan, by the way. So I'll provide you the example from our country. So recently, uh, the Ministry of Climate Change has been uh, doing some projects uh, related to implementation and also the billion tree tsunami and some other projects. Uh, so they actually are fostering the collaborations with university and academia, and they are uh, running some public awareness campaigns which actually target the youth groups. So I believe that this is a very good example and uh, from especially coming from the uh, developing country. Thank you. Um, that's, that would be really helpful. Oh, that's great. Okay, so there is another question from Jani. Is there any advice for youth groups wanting to partner with researchers? I believe that the researchers who are part of the youth groups can actually derive the change. They can help people connect with the researchers and then they can kind of derive the policy recommendations into the process by presenting those policy recommendations or concrete, concrete evidences to the government level uh, as a youth NGO or as a youth group. This is what we are also doing as a part of the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, Youth Constituency, which is called as Yongo. So that's a very good example. Krani is saying that the youth needs to be exposed with the policy that we will. Elliot, our breakout room also uh, got cut off because people had a lot to say. <laughs> so really, really interesting uh, to see this in the chat from you, uh, because I think the breakout rooms were really uh, engaging, uh, and we were still uh, talking about quite some really uh, impressive and important issues when the time was up. <laughs> yeah, really interesting discussion. I'd also mention, of course, on Zoom, you can private message someone. Uh, so I know we did introductions in our room. If there was someone whose work aligned with your own, uh, feel free to start a conversation here. I think that's definitely what a conference is like this all about. Good. 
um, happy to have everyone back. And uh, at least I can speak for group A that we had pretty much very great discussion. And I want to believe that it was the same across the other groups. Uh, at this point, um, first of all, we would want to have some uh, some few minutes to share notes. Um, uh, with, we, we want to have at least one person from each of the groups um, sharing what they discussed and to, to, so that the rest of us can have the privilege of hearing that. And then um, if that doesn't take so much time, we would have the opportunity to actually clarify some few things by way of questions and answers with respect to what already happened, with respect to the groups and with respect to the earlier two presenters that we had, uh, I'm referring to Joshua and uh, Ifan. So um, I'd like to kind of make it a bit unconventional. Can we start with group C? Hi, thank you, Desmond. So I'll uh, turn off my video because internet was kind of bugging with it. So we discuss about the gaps between the policy and political awareness, and then we discuss about different knowledge needs due to the different needs of the politicians and the government agencies, and the policy relevant science communication, which needs uh, to foster the collaborations between the academia, government, policymakers, and other different stakeholders. Then we discuss about the role of the NGOs and the early career researchers uh, since there is a need to have an approach uh, which is based on the utilization focused evaluation research and the effectiveness of the proposed policies which should not only concern uh, which should not only uh, kind of address the public problems but also the solutions and propose the consequences of the policy decisions. Um, also, there were some great insights coming from the audience uh, regarding the local level, uh, local level adaptation actions and the collective evidence from the communities. Uh, someone also mentioned the role of the uh, knowledge collection based on the individual uh, communities and also from the indigenous communities. And uh, there was also a great uh, uh, insights uh, regarding the uh, role of uh, the uh, research uh, that should be, uh, you know, very relevant with respect to the practical implementation of the uh, adaptation actions and the uh, role to strengthen the collaboration between the young scholars and the practitioners. Uh, there was a great focus on the utilization for focus evaluation, basically, because there is a need for the scientific evidence to go beyond the providing the scientific evidence, uh, since it's not just alone for the policymakers to take appropriate measures. Uh, therefore, it should be politically relevant and advice needs to address the very practical concerns. So that was some of the highlights from the breakout room number three. Thank you. Oh, wow, this is great. Uh, yeah, can see how much information we have been able to gather with such a small time. Thank you so much, Grace, and everyone in that group. Uh, let's move to group B. Okay, should I start? Yes, please. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, our uh, discussion was so fruitful and uh, we come up with a lot of um, point and especially with some solution. Uh, so actually we talk about the barrier which uh, young, young people have uh, while uh, participating in the UNFCCC negotiation. So first of all, during the discussion, it came out that we really need a kind of a precise, a clear structure of UNFCCC, that how it's work and how it will involve you to make for the other uh, participants, for the young people, uh, and will make it easy that how they will uh, participate in this whole negotiation and planning processes, you know, so there should be a clear planning um, that everyone, uh, especially uh, 
the interested youth who are interested to take uh, and participate in these negotiation can have a clue that how to go and where to go and what to do and how to do. Uh, and the second thing is also about the, uh, the structure also from the government, uh, not just from UNFCCC, that uh, government also have to be a kind of special body, like we can say a special focal point or maybe a youth focal point, a platform, uh, where they also orient the youth about, about, the, about the different activities uh, and that how they approach it, how they negotiate and how they put their voices on this uh, big negotiation. If you talk about COP and other this platform, that how they can go there and how they can put their voices on, on the negotiation table. Uh, and they can also can come up with, 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 some, with some support. And there was also interesting insight shared with one of the participants. I shared a story that yeah, we saw that the, the same people are going to, um, to those uh, conferences anywhere. So there's no new faces, you know. So the same people go there having the same discussion. So I think so it will be also good to orient uh, this process and not the same delegate are the same young people go to every training, but there should be like people from different background. And it's also the responsibility of those people who already participated from a country to orient and also to aware other youth that how this whole process work and how they can get engaged. So maybe over to Joshua and Anisa if they want to add something more, if I skip some point. Just quickly to add that also for for young people to uh, and people outside the, the the government space to also understand that the the COP is meant for the parties, which are basically the countries, and they have the biggest mandates. So one of the best ways to engage is to sort of get in touch with governments or people uh, or institutions that are accredited to the COP. Um, and, and know that their inputs would have a, a long way to go in integrating into policy than just a sort of um, going as an individual outside this framework, which is structured by the UNFCCC. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's it for your group. Thank you so much. That was also quite a lot. Um, uh, um, is there someone who wants to share for group A? Yeah, I, I picked some notes, but then, uh, yeah, Elliot, if you want. I'll give it a go. Sure. So we started with some introductions to the group members, uh, hearing uh, more about their work, uh, contextualizing the session. Uh, so it seems we had a large uh, show out from the civil society sector, uh, so very much framing discussions from the organisational level, uh, how we could better incorporate youth into uh, designing uh, these programmes and incorporate those intergenerational aspects that way as well. Uh, so uh, from that we uh, took a few tangents, we looked into uh, the effect of uh, rural work and how that may affect youth participation, uh, so trying to work uh, with uh, local communities and trying to contextualize the issues. Uh, so drawing back uh, youth uh, from uh, the central framing, uh, but trying to uh, position them as uh, stakeholders in uh, respect that uh, they are directly affected uh, by the issues we face. Uh, so they are important voices to listen to and uh, frame them uh, in some cases as victims of these issues uh, to be able to uh, gain that voice uh, potential uh, pros and cons of uh, such method. Uh, we talked also about uh, trying to uh, enforce uh, some quotas. Uh, so uh, Finn very wisely brought up uh, the need to uh, add these uh, positionings into uh, financing and organizational structuring. Uh, so the possibility of quotas as an enforcement measure uh, towards youth participation and towards intergenerational dialogues that way, uh, which was fascinating. Uh, we also had the point brought up that youth as a stakeholder is an interesting uh, way of uh, framing the issue because youth are so diverse. Uh, so uh, we had a brief discussion on how that may affect uh, the potential routes we take forward in terms of uh, recognizing the diversity within uh, the youth movement and recognizing this as an evolving field of pursuit as a potential uh, to then have to integrate youth-led organizations and social entrepreneurship, as well as the more traditional figureheads, uh, traditional corporate stakeholders and charities, NGOs, 
so some of the complexity of the uh, position we're faced with, some of the complexity of the field we're working in. Uh, I raised a point about mass individualism, uh, so trying to place the individual, uh, be it youth or otherwise, within a wider collective context, uh, so be that the youth movement within uh, wider sustainable development dialogues, or be that an individual within a team, within a project, and uh, the potential for that philosophy, that model, uh, to be able to improve outcomes. Uh, finally, we discussed some other potential methods, so uh, branding, storytelling, framing, uh, which can be used to incentivize youth to be part of uh, dialogues, uh, to participate in intergenerational programs, and using that as a route to community building networking uh, as a means for engaging youth in sustainable development. Thank you so much, um, Elliot. Uh, I think basically that is what happened in the group A. And um, yeah, of course we discussed really very relevant things. Uh, some are more re-emphasizing the need and some are actually uh, speaking direct to solutions that are being created on the ground. Um, but then I would bring that into the summary that would come soon. But then at this point, I want us to, to look back what have transpired so far. Um, there are people who probably have not gotten the opportunity to speak. I want to open this particular period to the participants. Um, you have a question, you have an input to make, or you, uh, or you want to, uh, yeah, to clarify something the floor is open. You can either raise your hand and I will notify you to speak or you can type in the chat and then I would pick it up from there. So please, the floor is open to all the participants now. There's a question in the chat. Okay, um, I'm not... Having asked, I'm not seeing. Could you read it out, please? Of course. Janet Chapman is asking Is anyone here working with the youth groups in Tanzania, please? I will give that a quick go. Um, I mean, from my side, Green Africa Youth Organization, we are not working directly with youth groups, but we have uh, partner organizations that are working with uh, youth groups, Nipe Fayajo. Oh. Um, so, uh, I mean, I guess uh, that the first is to probably get involved one way or the other. Uh, but yeah, if you let me know, I can put you in touch um, with our partner in Tanzania. Yeah. Um, also, uh, in Group A, we had Katarina, who is uh, kind of involved in, uh, I think, uh, working with some of the islands or something like that with respect to youth in Tanzania. Um, if she wants to say something about this. Another person, Shukrani Duxoni, says that they are as well. Um, you can definitely unmute yourself and um, speak if you like. Thank you for helping me fish out the comments. I'm using so many multiple screens. If you have questions as well, <clears throat> we still have uh, seven minutes to to answer to ask and answer questions. Can I ask a question? Please. It's, um, my name's Jess. I'm, I'm um, calling in from uh, Melbourne in Victoria, Australia. So hello, everybody um, around the world that's logged into this. It's really cool to see everybody. Um, I'm, unfortunately, I logged in a little bit late to the session. It may have already been raised, but something we find in the context, I guess, of our sort of adaptation work is that youth tend to engage more in the mitigation side of things, particularly around advocating for 
for change and mitigating the problem. Um, and it's, you know, along with, um, you know, Greta, Greta's um, school youth movements and others that, you know, quite a lot of youth is engaged on that side of things and perhaps less so on the adaptation question and, and um, the adaptation issue that we, that we really need to engage youth on as well in terms of being part of the um, decision making and actions for the future. I'm just really interested to know, and I, I understand the context is very different for everybody that's in this room um, as well in terms of the level of engagement, but whether that's something that others um, deal with um, and how they go about that. And, you know, obviously we've heard a little bit about how, you know, creating a narrative that, that youth can really buy into is really important, but whether that's an issue or something that others um, deal with too. Great. Can I take that question quickly? Yes, thank you. Yeah, so Jessica, thanks for bringing this. Um, of, definitely, this is a big, uh, big issue. Um, something that our paper last year looked a bit into that to see why uh, our conversations from the youth side very mitigation led. Um, earlier this year, also looked at about that, looked into that, and they're currently holding consultations around the world with young people uh, um, to figure out how to really make adaptation part of the conversation for young people. The challenge that or the understanding we've come to also from COP25 in Madrid, uh, um, where we were sort of also talking with uh, children in the climate, uh, changing climate coalition and other stakeholders uh, have been that it's difficult for people to understand what adaptation is. And that's, that is the simple thing. For any other thing, it's very simple. Less flights, straightforward. Plant trees, straightforward. Uh, if you talk about climate insurance, what do you mean by that? If you, the, and the whole concept of adaptation has been misconceptualized by some young people to believe that that means that we don't do anything about climate change, we just try to get used to it. So this is what we discovered as a sort of a narrative for, for young people. And hence they would go in for what is more mainstream which is eat less meat, uh, less flights, uh, uh, reducing consumerism. These are all important, very, very uh, uh, factual, and, and we have to do all that. Uh, but sort of getting to break uh, uh, um, adaptation down to say that, look, this is all important, but some countries and some communities need the solutions today. And even if we suck out all the CO2, it's still not going to do so much help. So you need to put this into your conversations as well. We need to increase funding uh, for sort of uh, community-based work that increases resiliency and, and sort of uh, reduces vulnerability of communities. So this is something that is a big challenge. And currently, I'm leading uh, the establishment of a youth uh, strategy uh, for the Global Center on Adaptation in Rotterdam. And what that is doing uh, is called the Youth Adaptation Network. And I'll put a link in the chat uh, later on right after I'm done. But it's to bring young people together to build their capacity on adaptation and uh, ensure so that they really understand what it means conceptually and in practice as well, so that they can make this part of the uh, uh, advocacy, because advocacy is really one way as it stands now. And that is not really going to help given the, the vulnerabilities that exist uh, mostly uh, in the global south and also the small island developing states. Yeah. And Elliot, uh, please uh, compliment this. Yeah. Sure. No, some really good points that you raise. Uh, from my perspective, I was doing some research on this as well earlier this year and found that it's the knowledge gap, the educational barrier, uh, which is causing uh, this uh, choice in terms of the youth where they dedicate their time, their effort. Uh, so obviously adaption policy work, uh, some of the more high level uh, dialogues are quite challenging to engage with. Uh, we've seen a positive feedback loop, uh, uh, which has been created in terms of youth historically aren't uh, participating in these dialogues. They don't have access uh, to these larger stages, uh, which means that they don't have to learn those skills and they don't uh, typically engage in uh, some of that protocol, the policy work, uh, which means uh, that there's no rising knowledge, there's no uh, rising skill set as we see the youth movement progress. Uh, so it's very much working towards the actionable goals, the deliverables, uh, which mean they feel they're making a tangible impact, of course they are, uh, but not aiming for uh, some of uh, the other uh, workers, uh, some of the policy work and some of uh, what uh, traditional organisations are doing. Uh, so very much focus on social entrepreneurship, uh, very much focus on youth-led movements, as opposed to integrating into some of the existing networks, just due to that entry barrier. So it's about uh, trying to take down uh, some of those uh, traditional barriers, which may be preventing them from doing so, uh, but also trying to incentivise youth to uh, 
but reach out to these networks to engage themselves and uh, breaking down some of these polarization that way as well. Thank you, Elliot and Josh. Anyone want to contribute on the same question or is there another question we can move to? Okay. Um, all right, so at this point, um, I'll take us through to, to summarize what we have been discussing so far. And, and of course, what does it mean as far as community-based adaptation is concerned at this point? Where do we go from where we are now? We have talked about quite a lot of things and we have come to almost the end of the meeting. Um, so at the start of this, we, the main focus was to kind of understand the issue and share experiences, share good practices if there are any, and to find out what are the act active ways that we can overcome these barriers uh, with respect to youth engagement in adaptation. And then, if possible, specifically identify opportunities that can strengthen the inclusion of youth in this in providing these uh, solutions. Um, and so far, we can take from the lessons learned from the first two speakers that uh, elaborated on why young people are sort of incapacitated with respect to the knowledge they have, with respect to the, 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 the credibility they have uh, what sort of recognition that young people have, and of course, material and uh, financial resources um, limitations that do not really permit them to operate in full scale. And also with uh, our second speaker, who also made it clear that when it comes to the word activism, young people are kind of very much at the front, but then beyond that, what happens beyond the, the activism, beyond hitting the streets, how much knowledge do they have to contribute to the process and how much opportunities uh, exist for them? Um, so the second part where we had to go into groups was much more focused on digging deeper into finding solutions to what we are discussing. And um, at this point, we discuss more of how do we make sure that the push and pull factors that draw young people out of communities where they could be uh, actively contributing to adaptation activities. How do we bridge that gap? and talked about the need to, con uh, to diversify the converse, uh, con conversation on this matter and make sure that young people uh, are, are being put in, in line to, to elaborate on the impact of climate change on youth and also to use that uh, protocol to make them major uh, stakeholders in the, the, the discussions. Um, one thing that was quite uh, interesting was um, a, a case in, in, in Kenya where, uh, where Finn talked about the, the, the fact that it's actually also difficult to mobilize young people when you, you go to the rural area. So even though we talk about these limitations created or perceived, create, perceived to be created by the, the structures, 
But then when you go into the rural communities, the, the, the problems exist in areas of being able to even mobilize. And then where you have the resources that are required, then you have the opportunity to, uh, to suggest uh, some quota system. But you have to also speak with the elders there. So it means that we need to look at this whole thing throughout the structure and 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 not just to see youth as uh, people who exist outside these structures. And also there were a lot of points on the, the, the fact that green entrepreneurship is actually a great opportunity. But we also had people speaking directly to the, the role that they are playing with respect to coordinating that young people, there are so many organizations actually working in these areas of integrating, bridging the gap between young people and the old, quote unquote. But then these are also working in silos and we need to coordinate these activities, uh, make sure that the agencies are coordinating in terms of how they want to include young people in adaptation matters, which I think is very, very crucial. Uh, then we talk about the role of policy process uh, to include and to strengthen young people in adaptation activities and why this needs to, to, to uh, factor in uh, state uh, actors uh, actively because that is uh, the, the policy levels are normally championed by state actors. Um, Promoting collaborative intergenerational research work is a point I think is really um, is really, really really important, and I was happy that it it has been raised. Uh, something we should look further to to develop it if we can actually have uh, create that portfolio where young researchers are able to collaborate with experienced researchers, then we can overcome the gap with respect to not uh, according young people's re uh, work with credibility and also an avenue for young people to, to, to become more influential or to become uh, actual decision makers. And then uh, with respect to the decision process, um, um, it's, yes, two things were mentioned here. The, 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 there's the need to have a clear structure with respect to UNF triple C uh, meetings uh, processes. Yes, uh, very, very crucial. We need to see where do you belong and at what stage are they involved and what capacity do they really uh, play? Are they just involved as tokenism kind of as mentioned earlier? And then the other point of we as young people and as organizations working to include young people looking at national government decision process to tap into these uh, as parties because that is where decisions happen that is where representations are selected and if we can capitalize on the national level and make sure that we look ourselves deeply in then we would have the opportunity to to represent fully so I think all these uh, are just few points that were, uh, that were able to capture and there are more opportunities for us to, to, to discuss this further. Uh, but I would uh, leave this point at this point to uh, Alexander. But before that, I think uh, also what we have to now consider as our next steps but I will let Josh come in at some point, is that this discussion should not be an annual discussion as we are doing now with CBA. But then as we go out of this, we would need, number one, uh, to, to make sure that we track each other, who is doing what, who is at where. And then if we are, doing, we are pursuing similar uh, goals that we can integrate, let us do that because if we leave this discussion and we don't carry this forward to our various points of uh, work, then we, we probably wouldn't go that far. So next, I don't know if it's Alex or Joshua, how much time do we have and uh, what do we do next after this? Thank you, everyone.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Desmond, for the wonderful moderation. Uh, to close the event and to, to, to bring it up to an end, I will say that um, I'm very happy to, to receive all your inputs and all the conversation that happened. Uh, next steps, so for this week, tomorrow, we have a session at 2 p.m., uh, which is an intergenerational dialogue. I mentioned the Global Center on Adaptation, uh, which is leading a global program on integrating uh, young people in uh, adaptation or putting youth at the center of, adap on, of adaptation. Uh, also working on uh, rural development, water infrastructure, and locally led action. And tomorrow we will have an intergenerational dialogue with the leadership of the GCA. Uh, and I'll be happy to have some of you signing up for that event as well at 2 uh, p.m. Central European time. On Thursday, we have a session on innovative financing for locally led action, where we'll be talking about how to get finance to flow to youth led projects at the, the community level. Uh, and same, uh, we will have some practitioners uh, and some uh, sort of experienced people with case studies on how they were able to do this to share the experience with us. So we're happy to have you there as well. And we will have another session on technology, how technology adaptation technology can enhance rural development also on Thursday. So please have a look at this and we look forward to engaging you in these sessions as well. Uh, thanks a lot. And I'll uh, hand over to uh, uh, Alex and Aliona if um, they have any final remarks on the logistics or any details. Thank you everyone for coming.